Hello everyone, Professor Bannock here to take the next step with you into propositional logic. Let's review what we've done so far. First, we constructed a formal language, that of propositional logic, and we've shown how to translate a significant, though incomplete, fragment of natural language into that formal language of propositional logic. To give you a technical term, that was called the syntax. The syntax of propositional logic concerns the forms of expressions that we have, how we can put different expressions together. We'll talk more about that term syntax in later weeks. Then the second step we took was to interpret those symbols with the truth table. We formulated a method for determining the truth values of the sentences that we put together using the syntax. To give you another technical term, that was called the semantics of propositional logic. That is concerning the meaning or the truth value of those sentences that we put together in the syntax. Using those truth tables, we can demonstrate the truth or falsity of any sentence that can be put together with our syntax based on the possible assignments of truth values to the primitive constituent. Of course, in this class, we're not interested in the truth or falsity of any particular proposition. We're just interested in setting our gaze on how the truth value of a whole proposition is a function of the truth value of its basic parts. Now that we're able to determine the truth value of any sentence in our formal language, we're gonna build on those results to show how accepting the truth of some sentences entails or commits one to accepting the truth of other sentences. This will reveal to us important interdependencies between the meanings of sentences in our language. This step has obvious implications for our investigation into the nature of reasoning. In studying reasoning, remember, we want to understand the passage of one thought into another according to rational rules. Another way to think about this is that we are taking the next step from formalizing sentences to formalizing arguments, that will allow us to check for the validity of the argument forms. Once again, in everyday life, you'd be interested in whether this argument is true or that particular argument is true. Here we're not interested in whether particular arguments are true, but whether certain argument forms are true. Argument forms are schemas for arguments, such that if you plug in a new content, you get a new art instance of that argument schema. So an argument form is really the pattern for an infinite number of material arguments. Here's an example of a specific argument filled out with particular content. Either the Lakers will win or the Rockets will win, but the Rockets didn't win, unfortunately for me, therefore the Lakers won. We can see using, we can see using the tools of propositional logic that the form of this argument is like so, either P or Q, not Q, therefore P. This argument schema or form can be filled in with anything you like for P or Q and it'll remain valid. That's why at the beginning of this course we talked so much about the definition of validity. So recall that an argument form is valid if and only if. These are all equivalent. These are four ways of thinking about the same concept of validity. It is impossible for the conclusion to be false when the premises are true. Another way to say that is there's no possible situation in which the premises are all true and that the conclusion is false. Yet another way to say this, the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. Finally, the conclusion preserves the truth of the premises. Luckily, we can test for the property of validity on an argument form using a very simple extension of the tools that we've already mastered so far in the course. Logicians have shown that this, the validity of every argument schema in propositional logic can be decided by, the, by means of a truth table. Of course, some really complex arguments with lots of connectives and lots of primitive terms would require huge truth tables, but in principle, no matter how complex the argument we could devise a truth table to test for its validity using a mechanical procedure. Later in this course, we'll reflect more on the philosophical aspects of these results. But right now, we just need to get used to carrying out that mechanical procedure with the truth tables. So let's use truth tables to check if this argument form is valid. There's one new symbol involved here. 
This is called the double turnstile. This symbol is used to separate the premises on the left side from the conclusion on the right side. There could be any number of premises on the left, but only one conclusion on the right. And what this symbol is saying is that an argument with premises P and P arrows Q and a conclusion of Q is valid. So we start by setting up the truth table in the usual way. We know how to do this. We've practiced this quite a bit. So I'm not going to go over this. If you're unsure about this, see the previous videos. Now we'll fill out the column heads in a little bit of a different way. One column for each premise and the conclusion. Now there's some obvious repetition here. Students always ask me, do I have to rewrite a column for P and Q when they're already over here? The answer is no, you don't have to. This is all a means to an end of checking the validity of this argument form. So if you can do that, whatever way makes you happy, I recommend doing the repetition because now we have the premises and conclusion nicely laid out for us in order. We don't have to jump around with our eyes and risk making small calculation errors. In more complex argument forms, things might get trickier. So it's good to just get in the habit of making a separate column for each premise and the conclusion. Now we simply fill out the truth table in the usual way. Here we just repeat the, the values for P. We're just doing that for our own convenience. In this case, we need to apply the truth table for the conditional. The conditional is only false when it takes us from true to false. And here we just repeat the values for Q on this rightmost column. Now we've got the premises here and the conclusion nicely laid out for us so we can carry out the test for validity. The validity test is to ask yourself, is each row where the premises are all true also a row in which the conclusion is true? Turns out in this argument, all the rows pass the test. Notice in this first row, we have true premises and the conclusion is true, so we're good to go. In all the remaining rows, however, there are falsities in the conclusion, but there are also falsities in the premise. So these rows also pass the test. Remember, the test is if the premises are true, is the conclusion true? But if the premises fail to be true, it doesn't matter what the conclusion is. And that's kind of anti-intuitive. Many students say, wait a minute, how can an argument that may have a false conclusion be valid. That's why it's so important to have a full grasp on the definition of validity. The only case in which an inference is invalid is when there's a line in the truth table that makes all the premises true and the conclusion is false. Otherwise, it's valid. Now, notice that never happens here. In the case where all the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. In all the other cases, we have a false premise. Remember, deductive validity is truth preservation. A valid argument preserves the truth of the premises. But if there's no truth in the premises to begin with, we can't blame that argument for failing to preserve it. A valid argument is like a well set up system of pipes. A well set up system of pipes will transfer water from A to B. But if no water is flowing from A, then it's not the pipe's fault that no water arrived at B. A valid argument is just like that. It's trustworthy insofar as it will carry the truth from the premises to the conclusion, but if there's no truth being flown into the argument in the first place, then it has nothing to preserve. So here we have a valid argument, and this is a famous form of argument. It's called modus ponens. If you have a true conditional and a true antecedent, then you can infer to the truth of the consequent. Let's roll through some more examples. I would recommend, again, at this point, pausing the video at each example and trying to fill it out for yourself and test for validity and then check back with the video. So we're gonna set up the truth table in the usual way. We've got the argument with premises not P and then P or Q and a conclusion Q, and we want to show that this argument is valid. So we know how to do the truth table for negation. We just flip the truth values. We know how to do the truth table for the disjunction. That's only false when both are false. And then here we have the conclusion. We've rewritten it, so we just need to 
copy the values over from the queue column. Now we've got everything laid out for us nicely so that we can easily perform the validity test without having to think too much. First row has a false premise, so we're good to go. Second row has a false premise, so we're good to go. Ah, third row has all true premises, so we need to check the conclusion. It's true, so everything passes the test so far. And here we have another false premise, so doesn't matter what the uh, conclusion is. All the rows check out, so this argument form is valid. Here we have a third example. Notice, though, we're doing something a little bit different. In this case, the double turnstile has a slash through it. That means invalid. So what we want to show here is that this argument form is not valid. It fails the validity test. This is a famous example of an invalid argument form. It's a fallacy called affirming the consequent. What we have is a conditional, and we have the consequent of the conditional, and we're trying to conclude the antecedent. You cannot do that. It's very similar to modus ponens, which allows you to conclude from a conditional and the antecedent to the consequent, but you can't go the other way around. That's one nice thing about the arrow symbol. The arrow symbol is telling us, hey, you can go from P to Q, but you can't go from Q to P. That's like going from, if it's a mammal, then it's an animal, but you can't say if it's an animal, then it's a mammal, because there's plenty of other types of animals. So to show that this argument is invalid, we can use the truth table. We'll start by copying the column for Q, apply the usual truth table for the conditional. We know how that works. It's only false when it goes from true to false, and then we'll copy the column for P. Now we can run the validity test. Here we've got all true premises, so we need to check the conclusion. It's true, we're good to go. Here we've got a false premise, so it doesn't matter what the conclusion is. Here we've got true premises. We need to check the conclusion and we got a problem. This is not a valid argument. It's got a row in the truth table where there is true premises and a false conclusion. Now all it takes is one row where that happens to make the entire argument form invalid. Once we find an invalid column like this, we don't even really need to bother checking the rest. It takes only one bad row to get an invalid argument, so the rest doesn't matter. We know that this argument is invalid. All right, let's do a final example. We're going to show that the argument form here is invalid. We have premises P or Q or R, not P and Q, and we're going to show that R does not follow from those premises. Notice we've got three primitives here, so we need to set up our more complicated truth table with eight rows. We know how to do that from the previous video. Now we apply the truth table for the disjunction. We know how that's going to work. Now we've got another disjunction truth table applied to P or Q and then to R. We know how that's going to work. We've got a negation P, so we're going to flip the truth values for P. Then we're going to just copy the truth values for Q and R over here, so we've got our premises and our conclusion nicely lined up. That makes the test for validity very easy. Our eyes don't have to jump around all over the place. Notice though that this was a uh, part, that this was, that this, that this column here for P or Q was part of building up the first premise. So we want to make sure that we do not take this row into account. Now we've got everything laid out, we can check each row. Well, this one has a false premise, so doesn't matter what the conclusion is. This one also has a false premise, so it checks out. False premise, checks out. False premise, checks out. Now we've got a row in which all the premises are true. Gotta check the conclusion. Oh, it checks out, we're good so far. Now we have another row in which all the premises are true, and there we have a false conclusion. That goes wrong, we can stop there. It doesn't matter what the other rows are. All it takes is one bad row to make an invalid argument form. So that's it, folks. What we've done is show a method for design. What we've done is show a method for deciding the validity or invalidity of any argument form in propositional logic whatsoever. In the coming weeks, we'll examine an alternative method for doing that. When truth tables become too unwieldy, we'll have a method called proofs or natural deduction. That's going to be a syntactic rather than a semantic method. And after that, we'll look at important results that connect the syntax and semantics together into an overall system.